We are in 2 Corinthians. It's a good thing I remembered. And we have studied uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 through chapter 7. Then we picked it up again in chapter 10 and finished out through chapter 13. We took note that this particular letter speaks more about the personal life and the personal person of the Apostle Paul than any other letter. We also took note that in uh, Galatians, uh, Paul would focus in on one particular issue, and that would be the Judaizers. However, in 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, he has expanded his thinking to a number of problems among the Corinthians, and he had to write them back and correct some things. Well, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. I mentioned to you that we would have a special study on these two chapters. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, we see the apostle solicitation or collection for the Judean saints. Whenever you study the particular issue, it really begins in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. We take note of verse 27. And the time frame is before the first missionary journey. And Paul is on his third missionary journey when he writes them. So that tells you we got about a 10 year period of time. What started it was Agabus, Acts eleven twenty seven. A prophet of God would travel from Jerusalem to Antioch, and verse 28, there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great famine over all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius. And the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren that dwelt in Judea, which also they did, sending it to the uh, elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So you have a plural of congregations, the Judeans, and there was more than one congregation there, those of Judah. And you had a group of elders. We don't know how many elders. Doesn't tell us. But we see that the elders would have the oversight of what was going to occur with the money that the Apostle Paul would have from the church at Antioch. So what you want to do on your map is start with Antioch and you would go to Macedonia, and you would go to Achaia, and those are the basic places that are involved in this contribution. And again, there's about uh, five to 10 years separation, totally, between the start and what you're reading right now. So they would send the money, and if you'll turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 25, we read just a little bit more, and this the letter to the Romans would be in 58. So 46 to 58, it could have been 57. It could have been 47. We just do not know the date specifically. In Romans chapter 15, verse 25, but now I say, I go into Jerusalem, ministering unto the saints, for it hath been the good pleasure of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints that are in Jerusalem. While you're listening to me, you might turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So what you have is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth and letting them know concerning this collection that started Acts 11. And he's still talking about it in Romans chapter 15 as he's going to Jerusalem for the last time. He does end up in Rome eventually. And what he's going to do, he's going to stir up the hearts of the Corinthians, those of Achaia, to continue doing what they had, had determined to do. They had prepared to do. They were ready to do. And so we've given it a title such as Paul stirs them up to a generous gift for the poor saints at Jerusalem. They had already decided to give. Problems arose at Corinth based upon who Paul was, it would seem. And those false teachers in Corinth 
would question the character and the person and the office, the ability, the capability of the Apostle Paul. That could have been the reason for them, the Corinthians, to stop their proposed giving. So Paul would write them. Let's take note of the things that he would stir them up over. I think it's extremely helpful for us today. In chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, he would stir them up by the example of the Macedonians. So when you see your map, you see the province of Macedonia, and right below that is Achaia. With Macedonia, you have a number of congregations, a half dozen, with uh, Achaia in that province of Rome. You have the church at Athens, and you have the church at Corinth. He's writing to the Corinthians. And he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God, which hath been given in the churches of Macedonia, the churches of Macedonia, how that in much proof of affliction, the abundance of their joy, their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Look at the Macedonians as to what they did as they were being afflicted, they still gave in a liberal way. Verse three, for according to their power, I bear witness, yea, beyond their power, they gave of their own accord. When one gives unto the Lord, he gives as he wills. No one tells him how much. No one tells him he's got to. There is no forcing, and Paul's not forcing them. Nor did he force the Macedonians, but he said they gave even beyond their own power and of their own accord. Looking at verse 5, this, not as we had hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and to us through the will of God. I do believe that's a key in giving to God. I do believe that's a key in serving God. That's a key in, uh, in worshiping God. We have to give of ourselves first, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, a living sacrifice, not a dead one. And so he calls attention to what the Macedonians did, and he says, that's a good example to follow. But we go on. We see a second thing in which he stirred them up. By the commendation of their love, he commends them concerning their goodwill toward the uh, saints at Jerusalem and in the area of Judea. Look at verse 7 and 8. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by way of commandment, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity also of your love. That word love, as we have called attention, is not a word of emotion in the original Greek. It is a word of will. One of the definitions that they give that I think is a better definition than love because love has produced a faulty understanding among people. Well, I've got to love people. And they go through this sort of romantic love for other people and for brethren. Now, whether that's true or not is not what I'm discussing. What I'm saying is the word does not mean that. The word means goodwill. You have a will. It is your thought. It is your purpose. It is your intent. It is your mindset. And it is good. It is bountiful unto others. Whether they deserve it or not is not the issue. It's what you have decided concerning. And thus, Paul says, let's see the sincerity and the proof of your love. He comes back to that in just a moment. A third reason he gives for stirring them up and uses is by the example of Christ himself. Now, right here, we could spend a month on the fact of Christ's love and goodness toward us. But in verse 9, for you know, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich and you don't get any richer, when you are in heaven, you do not get any richer than Jesus Christ. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. He gave that up 
Philippians 2, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Rich in what way? There are the prosperity preachers, the prosperity gospel. They go around telling you that if you will give to God, God will give to you. That if you will become a Christian, God will make you rich and wealthy. That's a failed understanding of Christianity. The richness is spiritual in the spiritual realm. Verse 10, herein I give my judgment. This is expedient for you who were the first to make a beginning a year ago, not only to do, but also to will. You had the will to do it. You had the readiness to do it. And you prepared to do it. We'll see that as we go. But now complete the doing also, that as there was the readiness to will, so there may be the completion also out of your ability. That particular, those two verses are repeated over and over in a variety of ways. It's their own will. It's their own thought. It's their own desire. It's their own uh, purpose to help the brethren, the Jewish brethren back in back home. But not only by the example of Jesus Christ giving up heaven and becoming poor, but by the need supplied unto others. The fact that somebody else needs something is an outstanding motive for me to do something about it. Paul says, verse 12, for if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according as a man hath, not according as he hath not. For I say not this, that others may be eased and ye distressed. First of all, he says, for those of you who are widows and you got two pence and that's all you've got, make up your own decision as to what you want to do. But you don't have to give it all. God is not expecting you to be in distress when you give. That's what he just said to him. And what you do is you give all you've got and you raise up the other guy to where he's got more than you. That's the principle that Paul is talking about. That's not what you do. Now, I will quickly add that there are a number of places to give and to do good in the world. There's the preaching of the gospel. There's the edification of the church. And there's benevolence towards those who are in need. We continue on in verse 14 with the same thought. And he says, but... By equality, your abundance being a supply at this present time for their want, and their abundance also may become a supply for your want, that there may be equality, even as it is written. And he goes into the idea of even as it is written. There is an outstanding vital principle in verse 14. And verse 14 will help us to understand a number of issues that people have made out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and the idea of contribution and the idea of giving. Your abundance, Corinthians, you've got a lot. And it will now supply the want of those who are in need. That's what he just said. But the basic principle is this also, watch. That their abundance also may become a supply for your want. How does God help the poor? How does God help the poor? What methods does he use in order to rain down abundance upon his people. I told you we'd come back to it, and we will in just a moment. I'm hoping I can at least get through eight and nine with some extra thoughts. <clears throat> so he would stir them up by the example of the Macedonians, by the accommodation of their love, by the example of Christ, and by the need supplied which 
possibly may be reciprocal. They may one day be in need. We're now looking at the fifth motive. He would stir them up by the integrity of those handling the money. Money. How important is that when you're handling money? A hundred percent of what you give to God in your contribution is how much gets into the hands of those who are needy. I'll come back to that. Verse 16. But thanks be to God who put it the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus, who he accepted indeed our exhortation, but being himself very earnest, he went forth unto you of his own accord. Titus said, I want to go back. I want to help him. We have sent together with him the brother who's praising the gospel is spread throughout the churches. Who is that? We don't know. Possibly Luke. And not only so, but who was also appointed by churches to travel with us in the matter of this grace. Luke? First one. This, that any man should blame us. You see his point? I think you do. We have two men of integrity. By the way, there's another one here in just a moment. But we have two men of a thought of integrity, of honesty, of reputation, of good reputation. And the money is being handled by them. Paul, why don't you handle it? Well, because I've been accused. But these two brethren, they are good men. In the matter of this bounty which is ministered by us, for we take thought of for things honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We want to do what's right in sight of God. But folks, we also want to do what's right in sight of men. A number of decades ago, I started preaching in full-time work in a congregation in southern Oklahoma. Little did I know how many problems they had at uh, Ringling, Oklahoma. One of the problems was their treasure. His name was Leon. And Leon was the only one to count the money that was in the contribution on Sunday morning and Sunday night. The only one. And some of those brethren questioned his integrity. He's putting some of that money into his pocket, we know. Ron, what are you going to do about it? Okay, let me preach on it. I preached on this passage. And afterward, in the men's business meeting, we installed the idea of two counters. Three counters, if you want three people to count. Don't let him count the money by himself. And that way, we will do all things honorable in the sight of all men. It did not, in my judgment, it should not have been a rebuke to Leon. And it should have been a help to other brethren. So Paul says, what we're going to do, we're going to handle the money to where... The money is handled right, and you know it's been handled right. Talks about another brother, and then verse 33, whether any inquire about Titus, he is our partner, our fellow worker to you. They are messengers of the churches. They are the glory of God. Show ye therefore unto them in the face of the churches the proof of your love of our glory on your behalf. We have boasted about you folks. We have commended you folks. We have talked about your love and goodwill towards others. And he says, show that, demonstrate that to Titus and the others. He knew they would, so he certainly appreciated it. Now, whenever you talk about charity, you need to be sure that you're doing everything above board. Charity Watch uses a letter grade rating systems that looks at the percentage of overhead spent on programs and the cost of fundraising. How much does it cost us to raise money? And how much does it cost to run the program? And how much money gets to the people who are in need that you're raising the money for? 
there was a fellow on TV. He's passed away now. He used to every year he would raise money over his t uh, radio program, and he would give the biggest part of that himself. And he says it doesn't go to anybody raising money. We do not have a concert group coming in that we're paying their ride, we're paying their stay, we're paying them money to raise money for this charity. That's what most people do. If you're going to raise money for people, you hire somebody to come in and help you raise the money. On the radio program, he didn't do that. He just said, the good hearts are going to support this program. And they did. He raised over $44 million over the years that he took that as his charity. On the other hand, on the other hand, there is a principle that is great. It goes something like this. The government says, the government says, we, the government, need to help you spend your money on people we think you ought to help. So we are now going to tax you. We will tax you $100. You send us $100, and we will get that money to the people who need help. You don't know who they are. Furthermore, it takes a bureaucracy of men, of officers, of superintendents, of delegates, of folks, of office workers. And so out of the $100, your $10 out of that 100 gets to the people that need help. Not to your neighbor necessarily. On the other hand, on the other hand, I look down the road, which we do, do. We look down the road and we say, they need $100. Do you know, lo and behold, they get the whole $100? It does not cost $90 bureaucracy to give those who are in need a hundred dollars. Which way is the most efficient? Which way do people get the most money out of? God's way. Always has. Always will. This charity watch would say that the Disabled Veterans National Foundation spent 4% on their program giving to people and 90%, 96%, on raising the money. On the other hand, the National Military Family Association spent 82% on the recipients and only 18% on raising the money and the office work that was involved in it. Well, not only by the handling of the money, but he would stir them up by their zealous example for others to follow. Chapter 9, verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your readiness, of which I glory on your behalf to them of Macedonia, that Achaia hath been prepared for a year past. Your zeal hath stirred up very many of them. What? Their zealousness stirred up others to do what they had readiness and will to do. They purpose to help those in Jerusalem and in Judea, the Jews, the saints there. And Paul says, I told everybody. You remember, this is not the first time in this section he has said this. So at the beginning, he used the Macedonians to stir up the Achaeans at the beginning of the chapter. But now he's using them, had used them, he said, in order to stir up others and their generosity toward the saints. He would continue on and he would say, But I have sent the brethren that our glory on your behalf may not be void in this respect, that as I said, you may be prepared. I need you to be prepared when Titus and, and the others get there. I'm not trying to surprise you or anything like that. I want you to be ready. I don't want them to come and find you 
unprepared, verse 4. This would put you to shame. I'm not trying to shame you. Verse 5. I thought it necessary, therefore, to entreat the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your afore promised bounty, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of uh, extortion. Christianity should not be extorting money from people. There are political activities, there are politi political activists that extort money from businesses and from other folks. Not Christianity. Uh, seventh thing in which he used to stir them up was verse 6, chapter 9, 6, by the principle of sowing and reaping. We are now returning to what I mentioned to you as a vital principle in verse 14. So keep that in mind. Verse 6. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. That's a principle in life. Now, I have some girls around here that started a little garden, a vegetable garden. And there's a little spot that's about a one by one square. And I think a young lady put 1,000 cantaloupe seeds in this one by one square. I suggested that may be overdoing it just a little bit and sowing liberally. So we may have to kind of prune some things out. But the principle is still there. If she were to put one seed of cantaloupe every one mile, that would be a tragedy. That's not very much cantaloupe for me. So I appreciate the thousand seeds in contrast to the one seed. But we recognize the principle that Paul is talking about in agriculture. You sow a lot, you reap a lot. That's his point. Let each man do according as he hath purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. He's telling you the kind of heart you ought to have. It is a heart that has goodwill towards other people that you're wanting to help them both spiritually with the gospel of Christ and the preaching and physically. You're trying to alleviate some of the hurt that this world gives in a fleshly way. And he says, each man will do as he hath purposed in his own heart. This is one of the things that really surprised me. I brought your attention to it more than once. We had a scholar in the churches of Christ back in the 1890s, and he wrote a book. And he made a statement that just floors me because he's smarter than that. Oh, you mean he's not as smart as you now that you think better than he does? No, I just mean it surprised me that he came up with this theory. Here's the theory. What we're going to do, he said, so that you can be sure and give as God said, we are going to appoint the deacons to find out how much money you make and to appoint to you how much you are to give. That's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. Or well, as Charles Barkley says, terrible. So we take note. Now I need David to do Charles Barkley instead of me. It would come out much better. Not grudgingly or necessity. He's just told you what he's, what he means by that. He says, look, you're doing it a free will. You have decided because of your heart of kindness and love and goodness that you're going to help those brethren in Judea. It's too bad from what the other chapters had to say. It's too bad that there are false teachers who have taken your mind off of that by questioning my character, said Paul. I have now proven to you, and I'm going to prove even more 
I proved it to you in chapter one to a degree. I proved it to you the first part of the letter, and I'm going to prove it to you at the last part of the letter. And the last part of the letter, he says, they had better repent. I will not spare when I come. They are false teachers. They are given an opportunity to change. But if they don't change, I will not spare, said Paul. I will be as bold in my presence as I am in my absence that they accuse me of. We continue on and we see, see uh, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound unto you. God is able to give you. He's able to just, just overflow stuff in your way. That's the way that's interpreted. That's not necessarily what he means. That ye having always all sufficiency in everything may abound in every good work. As it is written, Isaiah 55, 10 probably, he hath scattered abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness abideth forever. He that supplieth seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Ye being enriched in everything and all liberality which worketh through our, us thanksgiving unto God. What God is going to do, he's going to bless you so much, you are going to be rich because you would give unto him. That's not what he said. We are now going to discuss as an important issue the gospel of prosperity, the prosperity gospel, and here is what they say. The behavior to which he exhorts them is grounded in God's own pattern of behavior. God is capable of overwhelming generosity so that they need not fear being short. that's false that's false in the sense that the man has said it brethren if you give and if you give and be generous and you give of your things and your stuff you'll never come up short you'll always have everything you need that is not what Paul said yeah it is yeah it is we will look at it hold on Here's another one. Some people may believe that God will reward them with a religious windfall if they support a TV evangelist who preaches the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is a controversial doctrine that claims that God wants his followers to be wealthy and healthy and that they can achieve this by having faith and donating money to the church or ministry of the TV evangelist. False. Absolutely false. But they get it from this section of Scripture. I asked Chat. Do y'all know who Chat is? It's not Chad. It's Chat. And I said, Do you have any examples of religious folks who received a windfall after having contributed to an evangelist? Prosperity gospel. Answer. A woman who donated $1,000 to evangelist Oral Roberts received a $50,000 check. Pause. Wait. Listen now. Listen. From her insurance company after her husband died in a car accident. Oh, God blessed her. Since she gave $1,000 to Oral Roberts, God blessed her by killing her husband and giving her some insurance money. That's what they're saying. That was the claim by Mr. Roberts. A man, we go on, who gave $100 to evangelist Benny Hinn received a $10,000 bonus, $10, bonus from his employer after praying for a financial breakthrough. So God will give you a bonus if you pray. Another one. A couple who gave $500 to evangelist Pat Robertson received a $100,000 inheritance from a distant cousin they had never met. 
God did that. These are the guys that will go on television and they will tell you these examples in order to get you to give. Paul is not doing that at all. There's nothing close to that when he says God will supply your need. Have you figured out how God supplies your need? From the text. Watch. Watch, please. God will supply your need. I'm going to give you two thoughts. Thought number one is found in verse 14. Your abundance being a supply at this present time for the brethren in Jerusalem and their want, their need, their poverty. That there may be, pardon me, that their abundance also may become a supply for your want. Number one, he says, you one day may be in want. Wait a minute, that's totally against the prosperity gospel. If you give to God, God will give not only what you gave, he will give abundantly above that. Physically is what they're saying. And you will never come up short. They said, Paul said, Paul said, one day you may be in want. Even though you have given from your abundance, one day you may be in want. Now, how is God going to supply and help you in your want, Corinthians? He says the answer, that their abundance may supply your want. God nowhere promises that you will win the lottery. God nowhere promises that someone in your lineage will die and leave you an inheritance or an insurance policy. That's not the way he works. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. And as you're turning to Isaiah 55, 10, and I forgot to go to 1 Corinthians, y'all will excuse me for that for a while back. Isaiah 55, 10, I call your attention to Ephesians 4, 28, where he says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands that he may give unto them who are in need. That's how it's done. That is how it's done. Isaiah 55, 10. I'm going to skip some words. Stay with me in the skip because it will go together. And I'm not leaving out words because I don't like the words. I'm leaving them out to make clear what he's saying as to my point. Isaiah 55, 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth, and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God blesses mankind with rain and seed, and he plants that the man plants it in the ground, and he will sow bountifully and he will reap bountifully from that. If you will go back into the context of verse 10 and 11. He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food is exactly what Isaiah 55 10 says. And it tells you how he's going to do it. Someone says, well, it's his providence that brings it about. Okay. I do not know the exact things that God does in his providence. In his providence, I know what he does not do. But he has said here, he has stated here in Isaiah and in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, he will supply seed and he will give food to the eater. How? Well, he sends the rain and gave the seed to begin with. It's a natural process, not, that, not an insurance process. Verse 12.
he would stir them out, uh, stir them up by the grateful hearts that will be praise God. Watch this. For the ministration of this service not only filleth up the measure of the wants of the saints, but aboundeth also through many thanksgiving unto God. It will not only handle the want of brethren, but folks will praise God because of it. He goes on. That's a great point. Seeing that through the proving of you by this ministration, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution unto them and unto all, while they themselves also with supplication on your behalf long after you by reason of the exceeding grace of God in you. So by, he motivates them by letting them know people will be grateful and they will praise God because of it. Here's something that we're going to study in the future. Looking at verse 13. For the liberality of your contribution unto them and unto all. King James says, all men. So what they gave not only helped the brethren, but also helped all men. That's a particular sticky issue among uh, certain groups. Any questions or any comments? We will be in the book of Romans next week. The book of Romans.